We've seen previously that you can use the Euler-Cromer method to predict the behavior of an object under the influence of any type of force. In this method, we update the momentum using the force and a small time step, and then update the position using the momentum, the mass, and the same small time step. But this setup assumed that the relationship between velocity and momentum was a simple linear function. And it turns out that the simple linear function works at very low speeds like we experience here on Earth. But if something is traveling close to the speed of light, the relationship between velocity and momentum becomes more complicated. If we graph this function, we see a linear-ish relationship for low momentum, but as momentum becomes higher, the velocity starts to flatten out. It turns out that this maximum velocity is the speed of light, giving us a speed limit for the universe. So here's a code with a structure that should look familiar to us by now. We have the Euler-Cromer method implemented here in lines 23 to 25. Um, we update the momentum here, momentum equals old momentum plus the force being applied times dt. And then here we update the position, the new position equals the old position plus the uh, velocity times dt. The difference is this time we're using the relativistic velocity. So we still have the momentum divided by the mass like we had before. The difference is that now we're uh, attaching this relativistic factor here. This is what we saw in the intro. This is that one divided by square root of one plus the momentum squared divided by the mass squared times the speed of light squared. And so it's the presence of this speed of light here in the denominator that makes the velocity uh, top out at the speed of light. Um, and we're gonna be graphing this sphere's um, position and velocity to get an idea of how the relativity is coming into play. Notice that our sphere is red. Red starts with R, just like relativity does. Um, and just as a reference, we've set our value C here, our speed of light, to be the real speed of light in our universe 3 times 10 to the 8. We'll be adjusting that in just a couple minutes. So uh, we're applying a constant force to this ball. We're just applying a constant force of half a newton to a one kilogram ball that starts out at rest. Um, so we should expect to see it move to the right, but now we're gonna see it move to the right relativistically. And there it goes, it's, it's, it's not moving terribly quickly, right? It's only half a Newton, but it is speeding up going to the right. You can see here on the position graph, we're moving uh, to the right and we're getting faster, um, just like we would expect. We can also see the speed increasing here uh, for the uh, for the graph of the speed versus time. And you notice we don't have a whole lot that's behaving too differently than, than you would expect before, right? So under a constant force, you expect the velocity to increase linearly. So you expect the, um, the position to increase like, uh, like a quadratic. And we're not really seeing a whole lot different here. And the reason for that is because we're not at relativistic speeds yet, right? This speed is way too slow. We're only just now getting about to nine meters per second. And we have to be getting close to 300 million meters per second in order to see the relativity happen. So let's do this. Let's increase our force. Let's uh, up this thing. Let's maybe give it a one times 10 to the six. And uh, let's see what that does to our of course, our, our red ball here zips off to the right much too fast to be seen, so we'll have to rely on the graphs. Um, here we've got our position graph. We're going out pretty far, so the, the, the picture is zoomed out too far to be able to see the, the red ball. We'll have to fix that in a little bit. Um, and then down here we've got the, the speed versus the time again. We're getting closer to, uh, to light speeds, uh, or light speed. Uh, we're almost to 10 to the seventh. Okay, so at 10 to the seventh, we are one tenth of one third toward the speed of light. And you can already see this thing starting to curve just a little bit, because remember, this thing has to reach a maximum of three times 10 to the eight. So we're currently at 1.5 times 10 to the seven. Uh, let's increase our force a little bit more. Let's maybe bump it up by a factor of five. Let's also increase our rate here, try to get up to the speed of light sooner. There it goes away. There's our parabola. Uh, but you can see here, we're already starting to get a little bit of curvature here. So we're getting up to uh, two thirds the speed of light and you see that the velocity is starting to level out. So remember, under non-relativistic circumstances, we would expect this to be linear and, and it starts out as linear, uh, but then it has to level out because it can't cross this upper threshold of three times 10 to the eight, the speed of light. And so our velocity is starting to level out here as we get closer to the speed of light, the speed is slowly starting to get more constant. What that means for our graph here is that we're starting to lose our curvature. 
right? If there's no acceleration, then there's no curvature to the position versus time graph. So instead of this being a parabola, this is now a hyperbola because our slope is approaching this constant value of three times 10 to the eight. Now, it's a little bit difficult to work with these speeds, right? The speed of light is such a huge number that it's, uh, it's difficult to, to work with, it's difficult to program in, to keep track of. It's also difficult to see on the animation here, right? Because by now we've zoomed out so far, we can't, we don't have any hope of seeing that dot. That's why what we usually do when we're working close to the speed of light is we work in different units. So what I can do instead of calling this three to the eight, three times 10 to the eight, I can just call it one. And now by setting the speed of light equal to one, all of my speeds that I measure are gonna be in units of the speed of light. And of course, that means we don't need our force to be five times 10 to the six. We can bump that, uh, let's just have that be a one for right now. Let's hit control two. So now we can watch this thing a little bit better. We get a better idea of how it's moving along. Uh, and we see here we've already reached a pretty constant speed after only uh, five seconds in simulation world. So our red dot here is moving along at a pretty constant speed. We can see that in the position versus time graph uh, with this thing being a parabola. I think I can probably decrease the rate again now. Now, of course, that's interesting to watch. But it's kind of hard to compare in your mind uh, what that looks like compared to non-relativistic motion. So what we're going to do to finish this video out is add in a non-relativistic object. So let's add in another sphere. We're just going to copy and paste. And we're going to call this guy non-rel because he is non-relativistic. And let's make him green maybe. Um, I don't really have a color that starts with N, I don't think. Um, so we'll call this one non-relativistic momentum, non-relativistic mass. And then I just have to give him an uh, Euler-Cromer update, copy and paste. And so I change all my rels to non-rel. Let's do copy and paste, paste, paste. Uh, let's see, I need that to be the non-relativistic momentum, non-relativistic mass, non-relativistic position, non-relativistic position. Oh. And of course, I don't actually need the relativistic factor anymore. Actually, let's leave that in because you, you're, you're still rel you, you can still have a relativistic factor. You just need it to be a one non-rel, non-rel and non-rel. All right. So I should be able to see a bunch of non-rels there. Okay, there I've got it. Non-rel, non-rel. Okay, that looks good. And then, of course, I need to graph uh, his information. So let's add for him a couple of uh, position and velocity graphs. We'll add non-rel position graph. And we'll call this one non-relativistic x. And then do the same thing here with the velocity. So this is non-rel velocity and non-rel vx. Okay, I need to copy and paste this name <laughs> so that I don't mistype it. Uh, let's see, where do I add that to the graph here? Okay, so we've got our position graph here and then we'll just add this piece. And so this just has to be nonrel.pause.x. And then I need to do the same thing with the non-relativistic velocity. There we go. And now I just need to copy this part. And, oh, I can't call that velocity anymore. Uh, oh, okay, what I need to do is uh, copy the velocity calculation. There we go, because notice up here, we never actually work with velocity. We're only ever working with the momentum. Um, so we'll call this one velocity equals non-rel, and I never need to reuse the velocity, so it's okay for me to rewrite it. Uh, so let's see here, so we've got the non-relativistic factor. There we go. And so now we should get a couple of graphs out. Oh, and let's change this one's uh, color to be green. So I've got a green graph for the green one and a red graph for the red one. And control two. So we've got our red and our green. Uh, you notice that the green is inching out ahead of the red because the green has no speed limit. So, because remember, you think of this in terms of the geometry, uh, this is a, the green one is a parabola, the red one is a hyperbola. Hyperbola has an asymptote where it can't exceed this slope of three, or excuse me, of one in this case. Um, and so the green doesn't have that restriction. So the green, the non-relativistic one, is gonna travel faster than the relativistic one. Um, here you can see in terms of the velocity, remember the, the relativistic speed uh, has to top out at the speed of light here at one whereas the non-relativistic one doesn't need to obey that speed limit. It continues on in a linear fashion forever. 
So this has been a pretty interesting result already. We've seen how we can compare relativistic motion with non-relativistic motion. Of course, this was just under the influence of a constant force. Uh, next time we'll take a look at uh, changing this force to be a variable force, probably the, the good old spring force like we love. And then we'll take a look at what happens when we move these things into three dimensions instead of just one dimension. So thanks so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.